Hello and welcome to this session in which we learn how to compute the taxable entity income and that entity is a state or trust. During the process, we're going to learn how to compute accounting income, learn about accounting income, also learn about an important concept in this in this context, which is DNI. And DNI is distributable net income. And I'm going to be referring to it continuously, DNI. Then eventually we would learn about allocating DNI to the beneficiaries. And I will do this in the next session because there's going to be a lot of information to absorb here. And before we got to this point in the prior session, I talked about estate and trust. How are they created? The purpose of them gave you an overview. So this way, if you're not sure about what, what is an estate or a, or a trust, look at the prior recording because it's better to have a good idea. So if you are an accounting student or a CPA candidate, especially if you're a CPA candidate, this topic is not well covered in your college education. And if it's covered, it's not covered that good or in depth. What I do at farhatlectures.com, I provide lectures plus examples, plus additional resources, true, false, multiple choice exercises. That's gonna help you increase your score at your CPA exam. No, I don't replace your CPA prep course. I don't replace your Becker, Raj, or Glime, or whatever course you are taking. I can't do that. I wish I can, but I can't. But I can help you improve your grade by 10 to 15 points. How so? I explained the material. Once you learn it, like once you go over this session today, you're gonna feel much, 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 much more comfortable with the topic of taxation of estate and trust. And here's what you are risking, really. This is my offer to you. Are you willing to pay $30 for a month just to try out my system? And this is your maximum loss where, where it could imp help improve your grade on the CPA exam and help you pass the test. Are you willing to make that trade with me? Okay, your maximum loss is $30. Your, your output, your gain could be passing the exam. You make your choice. And if not for anything, check out my website to find out how well is your university doing on the CPA exam. If you are taking any other accounting courses, I have supplementary and lectures for other courses. Please connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so and check out my LinkedIn recommendation. Students that already used my system, they write recommendations on my LinkedIn. Please look them up. Like this lecture, share it. If it benefits you, it means it might benefit other. So why not share the wealth, connect with me on Instagram and Facebook as well. So we're going to be using those steps to compute the taxable income for a state and trust. Okay, so what, what are those steps? And we're going to be defining each one of them in this session. We mentioned some of them in the prior session. I told you, don't worry, we'll mention it in the next session. And this is the next session. First, step one, we're going to determine accounting income. This is the first thing we're going to learn today. Step two, we're going to compute entity taxable income before the distribution deduction. This is the distribution deduction, something we're going to learn about shortly. Step three, determine the DNI and the distribution deduction. Once you determine the DNI, you'll be able to determine your distribution deduction. Once you determine your distribution deduction, we're going to go back and compute taxable income like step two less step three. So we're going to find a number here. Let's, let's assume the number here was 10,000 and the deduction here was 2,000. Well, then 10,000 minus 2,000 will give us here 8,000, and this will be your ta actual taxable income. Then step five, as I told you, we will not worry about this in this session. We'll take care of it next session. So simply put in this session, I just want to give you the big picture. We're going to learn about computing three things, actually more than three, but those are the big three things. Accounting income, the first thing. Then we're going to learn how to compute taxable income for estate and trust. So the whole thing is to compute taxable income for estate and trust. But before we do so, we need to know we need to know accounting income. And actually, we need to know what DNI is. And from DNI, we're going to find the distribution deduction, then go back and compute taxable income. Don't worry, we're going to be going back and forth, back and forth a little bit. But believe me, I will. you will understand what's going on shortly. Starting with accounting income, that's very important. So what is accounting income? This concept is kind of a little bit odd for a tax class because in a tax class, basically you have taxable one figures like tax figures. Here, you're gonna have accounting figures and tax figures. Don't worry about it too much. It's very easy and straightforward. Let's go ahead and start first define what's accounting income. Usually, and the reason I say usually because these rules are by state, but usually you can, on the CPA exam, 
um, on your tax course, you can go with this information. Accounting income is the amount of income the beneficiaries of the trust or estate is, elib is eligible to receive from the entity. So simply put, how much are you eligible to receive from the entity? We call this accounting income. Accounting income is based on, how do we determine this? Based on the controlling or grantor document. What is this controlling or grantor document? Well, the person that created the trust, they determine how much they want to give out, give out or make the beneficiaries eligible to receive from the trust. This is what, this is what, uh, this is what accounting income is. So when I, when I create my trust, I say, I want my interest to be distributed, my dividend to be distributed, capital gain not distributed, or capital gain distributed, whatever I want to do, I determine this. So either the document will state this, or let's assume the document is silent. The state law determine whether amounts are allocated to the corpus or to current income. Remember in the prior session, we looked at something called current income and corpus. So once I have a trust, let's assume I have a trust for my son. And what I do is this, I put stocks, bonds in there. And I tell the trustee, the person that's in charge, my lawyer, I'll tell him, look, this, these assets, my stocks and my bonds, my son cannot touch them. But any dividend and any dividend and uh, interest going out of this trust, my son can use it uh, for his education. So simply put, let me go back and maybe draw this trust again. So remember, this is the trust here. This is where I have my assets, okay? And I am the grantor. I, 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 I gave the money. I put that money into the trust. I have a trustee who happens to be my lawyer, and I have the beneficiaries as my son, Adam. Okay, I'm just making this up. So what I do is, I determine I have assets in here, I have stocks and bonds, so I tell the trustee, you know, the interest and the dividend, my son can use it for whatever purpose. The the corpus, the principal, the actual stocks and the actual bonds stays in there until, for example, my son turns 30, 35, whatever age I want I want him to turn into, then I'll give him, then I will close the fund, not the fund, the trust. So this is basically what we mean by allocating between the current income and the corpus. And why is this important? Here's what's going to happen, and I'm going to give you the big picture here. The, look, the income, anything that's allocated to income is going to be taxed by Adam. Anything that's going to be considered corpus, the trust will pay the taxes on it. Remember, we don't have double taxation. So the money is not double taxed, but we have to determine who's going to pay it. Is it the trust going to pay the taxes or the beneficiary? Anything that's considered income, my son Adam will pay it. Anything that's considered part of the corpus, I said this is going to be part of the corpus, and I can make anything part of the corpus, or I can make anything part of income, then it will be then it will be taxed, uh, ta paid the tax paid by the trust. So that's important. And I talked about this in the prior session, if you want to look at this topic. If the entity distribute, distribute income currently, that income should generally be corresponding to accounting income. Generally, uh, generally. It doesn't have to because, again, I can do whatever I want to, but we're going to say it's going to be accounting income, the, the amount that can be distributed, like interest and dividend, generally speaking. When specific items of income and expenditure are allocated either to the income beneficiaries or to the corpus, the desire of the grantor or the decedents are put into effect. Again, the grantor determine or the person that passed away from their will, okay, when I pass away, if I have a will, this is what happened, my wishes will be put into effect whether something is considered uh, income or corpus, part of the corpus, part of the principle. Okay, where the controlling document is silent, again, the state will determine whether this amount should go to the income is considered income or corpus and this is basically an overview whether they generally considered income allocated to income ordinary and operating net income from trust assets any ordinary income interest dividend trend royalty income one half of the fiduciary fees and commission allocated to the income then what's considered part of the corpus of the of, of the actual of the actual trust any depreciation on the business asset, if I have a building, um, I have a warehouse, whatever I'm renting, a casualty gain or loss on income producing property, again, on the property, on the income producing, whatever that income producing property is, my warehouse, my, uh, my, 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 my office building, my commercial real estate, whatever it is, any insurance recoveries from income producing asset. Again, if I, re I receive any recoveries, that is so one of my buildings uh, was on fire, I received insurance recoveries it goes to the corpus the corpus will pay taxes 
capital gains and losses on the investment. Sometimes you might have losses, sometimes you might have gains. You might, you know, the trustee might sell some asset, incur losses or gains. It stays, anything is absorbed by the corpus, which is the trust itself, the corporation. Any stock split in one half of the commission. So notice one half of the commission is allocated to income, one half of the commission is allocated to the uh, to the corpus. Let's look at an example to start to kind of see what this accounting income basically means. The Arnold Trust is a simple trust. And we, we talked about the simple trust and the complex trust in the prior session. If you don't know what this is, please go back and view it. Miss Bennett is the sole Benny. In the current year, the trust earns $20,000 in taxable interest and $15,000 in tax exempt. So they have taxable interest and tax exempt interest. In addition, the trust recognizes $8,000 of capital gain. So they received taxable interest, interest free, um, tax free interest, which is tax exempt interest, and capital gain. The trustee assesses a fee of $11,000 for the year. So the trustee said you know, there's an $11,000 charge. Okay. If the trust agreement allocate fees and capital gain to corpus, so here's what's going to happen. The, the the agreement says any long term any gain any long term capital gains and any fees they stay with the corpus okay what else then the other thing is considered accounting income goes to the Benny um, so if the trust allocate fees and capital gain to corpus trust accounting income again here we are computing accounting income is thirty five thousand why thirty five thousand it's the fifteen of the tax exempt and the twenty thousand taxable taxable amount. So the income Benny receives no immediate benefit from this trust capital gain. Look, Miss Bennett is not receiving the capital gain, therefore she should not uh, she should not bear of any of its financial burden because, you know, it, she's not getting that capital gain. If the corpus is getting the capital gain, the corpus will pay taxes on that capital gain. And they said any any fees it gets deducted from the corpus. That's what the person the individual wanted to do. Assume the same fact, except the trust agreement allocate the fiduciary fees to income. Therefore, well, we generated interest, but guess what? That some of that interest, not some of it, the interest will pay the fiduciary fees. Who decided this? The grantor, the person that created the fund. What's going to happen is this. Ms. Mrs. Bennett would receive 35000 of interest income. Well, then she's going to have to pay 11000 Not she, but that's what's going to happen. They will do this computation, and the trust accounting income is 24000 Let's change the scenario. Now assume that the trust agreement allocate uh, all capital gain and losses in one half of the trustee's commission. What is the accounting income? Well, 35,000 for the interest, 8,000 of capital gain, minus half of the fees for the fiduciary, therefore 37,500. What happened to the remainder of this fee? It goes to the corpus. The corpus is responsible for it that's the big picture let's kind of just to kind of um, confirm our knowledge and increase our knowledge let's compute accounting income here okay complete the chart below indicating the tigers trust entity accounting income because that's something you need to know for each of the alternatives for this purpose use the following information we have interest income we have and that interest income is taxable we have interest income that's tax exempt 30,000, interest income that's taxable 300,000. Sorry if I read all the numbers. And the reason I read all the numbers, I try to read all the numbers because I do have blind viewers and they always ask me to please read the numbers. So if you feel I am reading the numbers, that's the reason I do so. And if you are a blind viewer and if I did not read all the numbers, I do apologize. I'll, I'll try to do my best. Okay. Interest income tax exempt. And don't worry about AMT preference is twenty thousand. Long term capital gain forty thousand. Trustee fee is ten thousand. So those are the figures that we are giving, and we're going to be giving different scenarios to compute trust accounting income or accounting income for this trust. The first scenario that says the fees and capital gains are allocated to the to the corpus to the trust. Well, what's left then? So the fees are out ten thousand dollar. We don't. Long term, long term capital gains are out. So what's left is 350, which is interest income, a taxable interest income, tax free, and interest income tax exempt but AMT preference. So 350. Let's look at the second scenario: capital gains allocable to corpus, but one half of the fee allocable to income. Well, so all what we change is from the 350 from the prior example is we're going to absorb 5,000 
of the trustee, 5,000 of the trustee fee, which is 10,000, we're going to absorb half. Therefore, accounting income is 345,000. Capital gain allocable to income, silent concerning allocation of fees. Well, now we're going to include the capital gain. Therefore, we're going to take, we're going to start with 350. We're going to start what we started with. We're going to add 40,000 of capital gains. That's 390. Then we're going to deduct 5,000 because the, if it's if it's silent, the state will say split the fee in half. Therefore, the accounting income 385,000. The last scenario, fees and exempt income are allocable to corpus. So notice what happened here. Now the fees, the $10,000 is allocable to corpus and as well as the exempt income. So this is also, it doesn't matter, you know, we're going to consider both of these exempt. This is also corpus. And they're silent in regard to the capital gain, capital losses. So when you are silent in regards to capital gains and capital losses, the state, generally speaking, will consider this corpus. Therefore, what's left as accounting income is only the interest income that's taxable, 300000 So this is just an, an overview to get it, an overview exercise to help you understand how we compute accounting income. Again, we have to know what accounting income is in, in the context of computing taxable income for estate and trust and to compute the DNI and the deduction for the DNI. Okay, so let's take a look at the taxable portion of it. So this is what a tax return would look like, 1041. I'm not going to go over everything separate, everything in details, but basically it looks like uh, an income statement. You have an income section and a deduction section. What is the income section? What type of income would the trust receive? Well, the, in the, the trust would receive interest, ordinary dividend, qualified dividend, business income, capital gains, farm income, ordinary income, other income. Notice we have no wages, right? <laughs> because wages goes on the 1040. <laughs> you know, the trust does not work, right? The trust has assets and those assets will generate income in form of interest, dividend, so on and so forth. Okay. Now, also, as I told you, it looks like an income statement. Then the trust will have deductions. What type of deductions would the trust have? Interest, taxes, fiduciary fees, which is a little bit unusual. You don't see this on Schedule C. But think of the fiduciary fees as think of you hire management. You hire people to run the company. You hire a CEO. You have to pay the CEO, right? You have to hire someone to run the fund. Then when, when you pay someone to run your company, you deduct their fees. Same thing. So this is kind of a little bit unusual. Okay. Charitable deduction. Charitable deduction. And this number is coming from Schedule A, Line 7, which we're going to see in a moment. So let's take a look. Just have a few comments about this. First, I want you to understand that this is, let me highlight the thing that's a little bit unusual. One is fiduciary fees. Okay. And again, as I said, this the, you will have a number here and think of it as the 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 uh, the salary for the CEO, and you can only deduct based on taxable income. What does that mean? This is important to know. So it's not you don't dedu you don't deduct everything. So let's assume you received one thousand dollar worth of interest. That's the only thing that you have for this fund, just for the sake of simplicity. Of this amount, six hundred is taxable. Four hundred is money bound. So in other words, sixty percent of the income is taxable. For 40% of the income is not taxable. Now, if you're paying your this person to manage your fund, I'm going to make this as unusual, $100,000. Well, you won't pay somebody $100,000 if you're only making $1,000, but that's beside the point. What's going to happen, the only amount that you can deduct here is the amount of 60% of the salary. Therefore, you can deduct $60,000. Again, the example is a little bit out of whack because how can you make only $1,000 in interest and you're paying someone $100,000 to run your to run your trust, okay? But that's beside the point. So the only you can deduct based on the taxable. So what you do is you look at all of your income, you total them, then you want to know how much is the tax free as percentage of the total. 400 out of 1,000 is 400. That amount cannot be allocated in terms of fiduciary fees, okay? So you only can deduct 60%. All right, so 60% of the trustee management fees is deductible. Let's talk about contribution to charity. Contribution to charity is 100% deductible, 100% of a deductible, 
as long as it's provided in, in a will. In other words, the grantor, the person that created the fund or the decedent, the person that passed away said, I would like to give you know the am this amount of charity. So the, you cannot limit that contribution by anything. If you, can, can, if you want to have a million dollar in income and you want to deduct the whole thing in charities, that's fine. There's no limitation as long as it's in the will. So the trustee cannot decide on the charity, the, ben the beneficiaries, let's assume that the kids of that individual or husbands or wife, they cannot decide on that. Okay, as long as it's, a, it's in the will, that's what we, it, it's deductible. Now you can give if you want to, but it's not deductible. Okay, then we have something unusual. So we, we covered the charity. Then we're going to come to this something unusual, not unusual, something that we have to be, that we have to learn about. And that's the income distribution deduction. And it's right here, line 18. Now, this is for 2019. The form 2020, 2021 could change a little, but the idea is the same. So if you're looking at this in 2021 and there are slight changes, obviously, you know, kind of catch up. Otherwise, it, pra practically, it should be the same. So income income distribution deduction what is that well guess what we're going to give the beneficiaries money remember we're going to make money we're going to make money from the trust but we're going to distribute it distribute some of it to the beneficiaries when we distribute it to the beneficiaries we have to deduct it here why because we are computing the taxable income for the trust well the money can only be taxed once if we're going to give it to the bennies the bennies will pay the beneficiaries will pay the tax on it if we're going to keep it in the trust part of the corpus, the corpus will pay will pay the tax. Okay, so you, you know, again, we might keep the capital gain, but we might distribute the interest. So the interest kind of, in other words, we're going to add the interest here, then deduct it here. Okay, deduct it here. Why? Because it's going to, and what's going to happen to it? It's going to go, actually, it's going to leave 1041, go on schedule K1, and it goes to the individual and the individual will pay taxes on it separately. It goes to their Schedule E. From their Schedule E, it goes into the, the taxable income. So those are three items that, that are unusual. And specifically, we're going to start to look a little bit more at this income distribution deduction. How do we come up with this income distribution deduction? Because that's important because that's going to determine. And usually it's it's a large deduction. Why? Because the trust may, be, may exist to give out that money. Therefore, we have to deduct this amount. OK, also. The trust will have an exemption. I, I spoke about the exemption in the prior session. Basically, we have three types of exemptions, uh, not exemptions. We have three types of fees. If the trust is a simple trust, here it goes $100. I'm sorry, simple is $300. You can deduct $300. If it's a complex complex trust, it's $100. And if it's an estate trust, if it's an estate trust, it's, uh, where is the estate here? Simple, complex. Decedent's estate, six hundred dollars. It's just something you need to be aware of. Now, maybe you, you're looking at this recording in 2022, and they might change those exemptions. They usually don't. They've been the same exemptions for years. Just FYI, in case they change, just you know, adjust accordingly. Now, remember, I told you about the charitable, charitable deduction and what's going to happen. It comes from Schedule A, line seven, and this is this is the second page. This is Schedule A. You just kind of compute your depreciation. You'll take this number and you plug it up here. You don't do anything. The software will, will do it for you. I only ever only completed only one 1041 in my lifetime. So I'm not very familiar with this, but I'm familiar enough that I can explain it to you. So it goes, the charitable deduction goes here. Then you have to compute, you have to compute this income distribution deduction comes from Schedule B line 15. Okay, Schedule B right here, line 15, it goes here. Now, here's what we need to talk a little bit more about the DNI, the dividend. Uh, I'm sorry, not the, not the dividend. This this tributable net income or DNI. So how do we, what's the DNI? Well, the DNI is the maximum, maximum amount of distribution on which the beneficiaries can be taxed. So first you have to compute how much the Benny can be taxed at. This is the maximum amount, maximum amount. Now, why is this important? You might give the beneficiary more money than they should be taxed on. For example, let's assume for the sake of simplicity here, you gave the beneficiaries a thousand dollar. Okay, this is the um, this is what you dis actually distributed the beneficiaries, but the trust only made just for the sake of the example four hundred dollars. So six hundred dollars. Hold on a second. So if the trust made a thousand of income. 
I'm sorry, you gave me a thousand, you gave the Benny a thousand. This goes to the individual. The trust itself only made an income of 400. So how can you pay more what the, what the trust made? Well, you can, because the trust have corpus, they have principal, they have bonds, they have cash, they have CDs, they have other assets. So it must have been that the $600 is from somewhere else not income well if it's from somewhere else then it's not really taxable to me if i'm if i'm the beneficiaries because the um, this money was already taxed how so remember when the person put that money into the trust when that person passed away let's assume it's a decedent when that person passed away the the trust there, there, there was an estate tax so the individual and it's really like around 50 percent paid paid their estate tax Okay, so let's assume they put in, in that in that fund in that trust a million dollar, and that individual paid forty percent on that. So that individual sent four hundred thousand dollar tax a check to the IRS, not the individual, the trust. Send the tax, send the check to the IRS because the person passed away. Now that money that's sitting in the trust already been taxed. So if it's distributed to you, think of it as a think of it as a return of capital. Why? Because this money is coming from. The tr from the corpus itself where it has been taxed okay so this is why we have to compute the dni okay so the the maximum amount that the individual and we're going to see how it, it works later on okay so how to compute now dni how to compute dni so here's how we compute dni we would first compute taxable income before the distribution deduction so basically what does that mean it means we're going to go to this page and compute this taxable income we're going to compute taxable income, but we're going to skip this number because we don't know this number actually yet. We're going to skip. So we're going to compute. We're going to basically compute everything except this deduction, line 18, except that we don't have anything here yet. That's what we're trying actually to compute. So we're going to first compute this. So find out taxable income before, before the distribution deduction. Then we're going to add to it. We're going to go back and add the exemption and that exemption could be 100 300 or 600 depending on the type of the trust that we have then we're going to add to it we're going to add to it net notice net tax exempt interest it means we're going to add back tax exempt interest but sometimes that's that tax exempt interest there's there is some expense related to it we'll deduct that expense we're going to add back net tax exempt interest then we are going to deduct capital gains why because capital gains stays with the corpus stays with the corpus then we will add um, we will add capital losses if that's the case but add this is add if there's any capital losses we add and we'll deduct capital gains and this is how we come up with dni dni so start with taxable income before the distribution and go through this now once we have dni once we have this number here dni line seven now we need to compute income distribution deduction this is the deduction this is the deduction that's going to go on the previous page how do we compute the income distribution deduction well we're going to look at the amount of distribution actually received we're going to be looking at the lesser lesser notice this is the income distribution deduction deduction this is the line 15 which is going to go on page one and we're going to compare this the lesser of the amount of distribution received how much did the benny received the lesser of that or their share of dni we're going to look at their dni minus net uh by net exempt interest so we're going to look at the dni minus net exempt interest the lower of these two will be on line 15 and from line 15 we're going to go back to page one and plug this number here on line 18 to figure out exactly our tax bill because this is going to give us the appropriate amount to compute our taxes where we have to pay the tax bill okay so this is how it basically works so the reason we go through all of this to find out what is on line 18 and what is really on line 18 on line 18 what went to the benny what went to the beneficiaries what went to them is deducted why it's deducted because the corpus don't pay taxes on it they'll pay taxes on it so it's taken out it's deducted from here it's deducted from here and whatever is left is paid by the corpus tax is paid by the corpus okay now the best way to illustrate this obviously is to actually look at an actual example to see how this all fits together and i will, I will work another example after this session okay because 
It's a lot. It's a lot. And the way the CPA exam review course, they're going to go with this with you. They're going to go very quickly and um, they're going to give you shortcuts. Great. If you want to memorize the shortcut, that's fine. I'm, I'm not against that. But if you understand them, it's just much easier. You'll have more confidence on the exam day. And this is what I do. This is what Farhat lectures, Farhat lectures do. I explain the material in depth. Therefore, you have more confidence on the exam day. Of course, you can memorize shortcuts, but better to understand it. Okay. The pork trust is required to distribute its current accounting income. So current accounting income has to be distributed annually to the sole income Benny, which is Barbara. Capital gains and losses and all other expenses are allocated to the corpus. In the current year, pork incurs the following items. They have dividend income, means they have some stocks in that, in that trust, taxable interest, tax exempt interest, net long-term capital gain, and we have the fiduciary fees. Okay, so here's all the income. The first thing we want to know is, what is the accounting income? And as I'm doing the accounting income, I'm going to also figure out the taxable income. $25,000. Is this considered accounting income? Well, look, it says they gave us a hint. Current accounting income. Yes, dividend is current accounting income. Why? It's current. It means they're generating this continuously. Okay, So it's going to be part of our accounting income. Is dividend taxable? Of course it is. Taxable income as well. It's going to go on page one as well. Taxable interest, 15000 Is it part of accounting income? Yes, interest is part of accounting income. Is interest taxable? Yes, it is. Therefore, it's 15000 as well under taxable income. Tax-exempt interest, 20000 Is that part of accounting income? Did we earn 20000 Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Is it taxable? No, it's not because it's by nature tax-exempt interest. Net long-term capital gain. 10,000. What do they say about net long-term capital gain? They said something about it. It's allocable to the tr to the corp. So it's not part of the accounting income because accounting income is what really gets distributed and what the beneficiary is responsible for. Therefore, there is nothing under accounting income. Is, is capital gain taxable? You bet it's taxable. Therefore, it's under the taxable column. Let's take a look at the fiduciary fees. It's $6,000. Is it accounting income? No, it's not. Can it be used for tax purposes? Is it deductible? Yes, it is. Is it fully deductible? Well, generally speaking, yes, unless you have taxable income. Do you have taxable income? Yes, you do. Notice you have tax exempt interest and I'm sorry, you have tax exempt interest. Yes, you do. You have 20,000. Well, guess what? We have income of 60,000, 40 plus 20, 60, of which 40,000 is none, is not tax exempt. So four divided by six equal to two third. So two third of this is actually deductible, which will make it forty thousand dollar. Now let's talk about the personal exemption. We're going to assume this is a complex trust fund. Accounting income? No, it's not. Is it deductible under taxable income? Yes, you can have a deduction of three hundred dollars. So your accounting income is sixty thousand dollar. That's your accounting income. That's your accounting income. And remember, part of it, forty out of sixty is is taxable and 20,000 was tax free. Your taxable income is 45,700, but look at me. I'm sorry, not looking. listen to me. It's 45,700 before before the the deduction distribution deduction. So we did not distribute the deduction yet because we first we have to find DNI. So how do we find DNI? We're going to start with again our taxable income before DNI, before the distribution deduction. So it's 45,700, okay, which is this number here. Then we're going to make some adjustment to it. You guys remember on the prior slides, I said personal exemption is added back $300. Capital gain is deducted because cap, why is deducted? Because capital gain stays with the corpus. It's deducted from that amount. And we're going to add 18,000 of tax exempt interest. Why 18,000? We have 20,000 of tax exempt interest then we have two thousand dollar that's related to that which is basically that two thousand dollar that we could not deduct we uh, on and here and here as a fiduciary fees we can deduct to arrive to net tax exempt interest which is eighteen thousand now we find dni which is fifty four thousand dni is fifty four 
thousand. Now we have to determine what is our deduction. Okay, that's fine. DNI is fifty-four thousand. What is our deduction? That's the question. How much can we deduct? Well, we're going to have to find out our deduction by taking. Remember, how do we find the deduction? Let's go back here. Let me just show you real quick on the prior slide. So this is the DNI formula that we that we used. Now the deduction, the income distrib distribution deduction, and this is what we're trying to find out, is the lesser of the amount of distribution received or the share of DNI reduced by net exempt interest. Now, we don't have the amount of distribution received. Yes, we do. We said distribute everything, 60,000. Now we're going to compare 60,000 to DNI minus tax exempt interest. So we're going to go back down here. So remember, we're going to have to choose between 60,000 60,000, which is the amount distributed, the lesser of this, or DNI, which is 54,000, minus, minus 18, minus 18, minus 18. So 54,000 minus 18, and that's going to give us 36,000. Therefore, the distribution deduction is 36,000, 36,000. Good. Once we know this, this, the distribution deduction, we can find the entity taxable income. What does that mean? Well, our taxable income was 45,700 before this deduction. Now we know the deduction is 36,000. Therefore, our taxable income is 9,700. So let's let's try to plug everything on the tax form this way it will just hopefully it will make more sense more sense to you so if we go back to the form itself let's go back to the form the tax form and basically after all said and done our income distribution deduction was determined to be 36000 dni happens to be here line 7 54000 and adjusted total income was 45000 700 now if we go back to page one page one basically simply put this is the magic number this is the 36,000 this is the 36,000 then we can deduct we can deduct um, as distribution deduction distribution deduction okay now let's uh, let's see what else basically in the next session what i would look what i what i would do is maybe i will work another example just to kind of reinforce this i will just this is an explanation i just always after the explanation for prop for issues like this i'll work an example also i will work on something something with taxation of beneficiaries to see how the beneficiaries paid their taxes how does it affect their taxes again before the end of this recording i would like to remind you to check out my website farhatlectures.com again if you're studying for your cpa exam don't shortchange yourself, okay? Your CPA exam is a 30 to 40 year investment in your career. Don't let a small subscription, a nominal subscription, holding you from passing the test, okay? Good luck, study hard, and most importantly, stay safe.